Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Parallel Systems broadcast. You know who I am. Today, I've got a new guest, Hervoye. He is the host of the Geopolitics and Empire podcast and YouTube channel. We were put in touch, Hervoye, from a mutual fan of both of our shows. So a shout out to David for having great taste and supporting us both in our endeavors. Uh, so first and foremost, Hervoye, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you want to add to that introduction with a little bit about yourself for viewers who may not be aware of your work, that would be fantastic. Yeah, very cool to come on. I love your work. And um, yeah, I'm US uh, fr from the US, Croatian, uh, also Mexican citizen. And uh, down here in Mexico, just doing my thing with the Geopolitics and Empire podcast, as well as uh, my daily live uh, TNT radio show, uh, you know, trying to fight against lies, tyranny, corruption, globalists, uh, and so forth. Oh, fantastic. I never knew you was on TNT radio. That's awesome. Yeah, I got my show. It's every day. Um, was it seven to nine p.m. New York? Uh, oh, time. That's super cool, Hawaii. I'll have to check that. I've been on Rick Munn's show a couple of times. I was on just last week, so that's uh, that's cool. But wow. there's so many um, hosts on there that you know, like you, you kind of like there's so much choice. But now I know you're on it. That's another one for me to listen into. Okay, so well, there's so much we could talk about Hawaii. So I'm going to leave it pretty open. However, I thought maybe a good place to start would be this idea of an AI ghetto, because I know that's something that you've spoke about on your show. I was listening to one of your interviews just today, and you actually brought that up, and I know it's a, it's a theme that you go back to. Uh, and for anyone that hasn't seen Hervoye's uh, brilliant um, show, his podcast, you can check it out on YouTube, although you can also find it on any podcast network and i would definitely advise you go do that hawaii has some of the best guests out there uh, some fascinating conversations i've only just started getting into it hawaii, so i've got a lot to catch up on but uh just looking through the list of different topics that you're on it's like well, this is right in my street so i'm sure it will be for everyone else uh so maybe we could start there hawaii we could maybe just have a general overview of where we are in history what we're looking at what we're facing and maybe you could introduce people to the idea of an ai ghetto yeah i prefer the term algorithm ghetto I, I took it from there's this book uh, edwin black uh the jewish historian i interviewed two years ago but i mean where we are in history i mean I, i've talked to other people like jay dyer and and, and others like i sort of agree with them that um and a number of other folks on tnt and my podcast that i mean i i believe i'm a christian and so i believe you know satan is basically behind he's the prince of the power of the air and behind a, a lot of these manipulations and the end goal is world government that's the end goal. Everything else is background noise to get us to that point of a global dystopia, global control system and technology is the key. Without technology, you can't get there. You know, we've had the empires in the past. You know, everyone knows them, Roman, whatever. They could only, you know, you've only got so many humans. You, you, you cannot, you don't have an army big enough to physically cover the planet. You need technology. And that's where the 20th century comes in. And that's the key enabler taking us to where you know where we are and where we're going and uh you, you saw covid in the first time in history unprecedented that all nations every single nation did the same thing never happened before in the history of humanity all thanks to technology the mass communication uh and um you know all governments linked together through the through the private sector you know all, all this network of globalist systems so that's where we're at uh and it's it's technocracy basically i was mentioning just yesterday, I was kind of shocked. I read a report. We're now experiencing fascism, which is, I, I think it's segueing into technocracy, right? Scientific dictatorship. Few people mentioned this. I think it's more accurately called algocracy. So you got these folks looking at existential risk like uh, Nick Bostrom and others. Um, Phil Torres, who I've actually interviewed. Hardcore atheists. Um, and they... You know, they talk about climate change and all of these threats. And they say we need, they literally say in their own, you know, white papers, academic papers, that we need a global government, a global surveillance state run by algorithm. And they call it algocracy. So a lot of people talk technocracy, but I like this term better. And basically, that's where we're going. And, you know, for here's just an example in, pay, uh, in April of this year, you know, I was banned from Patreon last year, April of this year, the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, rolled out the Disinformation Governance Board. That same week, Bint Press News, Consortium News, and myself were banned forever from PayPal. A report came out from the Foundation for, of, of Freedom or something. What's it called? I have it here. Um, 
yeah, Foundation for Freedom Online, delving into uh, this stuff. And basically, I was shocked because I knew since April it was the DHS. But here they, they, they say in the report, any U.S. citizen posting what DHS considered misinformation online was suddenly conducting a cyber attack against U.S. critical infrastructure. That was the legal framework under which the DHS drew their jurisdiction. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're classified as non-kinetic threats. And that's why we're getting accounts banned. People are having bank accounts closed, Kanye West, um, many other people. And so this is the algorithm ghetto. And Edwin Black, for me, explains it the best. I had on Aaron Cariati. Uh, he calls it the biomedical security state. And it's basically, they're taking our physical world, all of it, and putting it onto this digital virtual farm that they control. And they're trying to sever that tie from the physical space. You know, no cash, no physical driver's licenses, you know, no physical paperwork, all on the digital system, which they control. We have no control over that. And then... As Edwin Black says, he he himself was Jewish, compares it to the physical Jewish ghettos uh, where you know Jews were put into these physical ghettos. Here you're going to be put into this digital ghetto called the algorithm ghetto. If you don't behave ideologically, if, you, if you're not uh, uh, you know, in line ideologically with whatever the system, you know, this DHS report says if you're questioning the elections, if you're questioning COVID, soon if you're questioning climate, I mean, if you're questioning gender, <laughs> right? Uh, it's going to be across the board. And so they just shut off, not just your socials, right? Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, your bank account will be shut, shut off. Here's another shocking thing, just to yesterday's story. German journalist, Alina Lipp, German citizen who's just doing reporting, just talking like me in, in, in uh, Crimea and Donbass. German government shut off her bank account. And it's it's under the, you know, under the oversight of EU as well, Brussels, Brussels and uh, Berlin. They shut off her mother's bank account and her father's bank account, the whole family's bank account. So this is the algorithm ghetto. It's like, no, as Edwin Black says, they're going to stick you in there. No one's going to want to help you because they're going to get thrown into the al algorithm ghetto, like Alina Lip's father and um, mother. So basically, you'll be shut off. Um, and you see the system being built out everywhere. Here in Mexico, my city is a smart city that's funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. I've got the white papers. There's no conspiracy I can show you. In the white papers, they're trying to make uh, Guadalajara, where I live, uh, a technocracy, like a smart city. It, it's, the white paper says cashless, getting rid of cash, all digital, um, pre-crime. Uh, they're, they're building out the internet infrastructure for surveillance. The public transport they're building here, uh, you can't take cash. Or you can't use cash in some of it. So you're going to have this digital card. Um, and again, if you don't behave, your public transport card will be shut off. You won't be able to pay. You, you won't be able to use public transport. You won't be able to work. If you don't get vaccinated, you won't be able to do anything. And then for me, it's like the book of revelation system. So, I mean, this is what we're, we're here now. It's just starting. I, I, I kind of refer to myself as a beta, beta tester for the mark of the beast system. I just, you know, instead of getting all depressed, I'm just, I know where it's going. Uh, you know, I have faith in, in, in God. And so just like, I, I'm a beta taster, you know, one of the first that gets to, you know, taste <laughs> this system. So. Yeah, well, uh, I've got a few questions I could ask from that, Hawaii, and I would like to uh, maybe ask why you've chosen to be a beta tester over there in Mexico City. But just reflecting on what you were saying, um, I always class it as I, I often use the term electronic concentration camp. And again, it goes back to this idea that um, I mean, that's essentially what we had in 2020 and 2021. We had this concentration camp light and it was self-imposed. However, it was done through fear and threat and people actually imposed it upon themselves for a good year, got themselves into psychological states that made them feel afraid, anxious and just desperate to get out. And then, of course, they got given the solution. Um, and that solution was to go and take, you know, well, there was a few of them laid out on the table. The, the key one was taking an injection, but there was also digital IDs and the rest of it. Uh, and like you, I think that's where we're going. We're going to an electronic prison. But there's also, um, you, you talk about the algorithm as well, being used against people. And on mass, that is what it's going to work. But there's also, like you just said, there's like assassins in the um, electronic uh, concentration camp too, who will target you specifically. I mean, I, I'm sure you're having no doubt that you were specifically targeted. You didn't just trigger something through an algorithm. It was actually, no, we're going to get him and we're going to make sure all of the different uh, companies that deal with him financially or whatnot 
um, take him out as well. So there's like, you know, if you get on the wrong side of him, they will target you specifically as well, won't they, Hawaii? But I think it's important for people to understand as well, there is going to be this massive uh, algorithm too, using AI that's going to target everyone. Because people right now might be looking at you and saying, well, he, he's running his mouth, he's making his podcast, that's why they're targeting him. But that's not the case, is it? It's for everyone that this is coming. Yeah, I mean, think about it. I know a lot of people... Croatians who grew up in communist Yugoslavia. So, you know, former Soviet Union, you know, it was similar like Soviet, it was like a Soviet Union light Yugoslavia, you know, my parents' um, age group. And they're the kind of people just like, keep your head down, shut up, don't raise a ruckus, you know, just, 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 just um, you know, in Kazakhstan, I knew people of that generation who told me to stop talking about politics in Kazakhstan uh, because they're afraid, right? They're like, just don't talk politics. Let the government leave me alone. Let me get on with my life, you know, talk about sports and the weather. And but what you just said, I mean, watch all these dystopian films, um, you know, like Brazil or even in the Soviet Union itself or totalitarian systems. There were there's plenty of examples of people who were trying to toe the line and they got caught up in these systems. And that's what you, you might think, OK, well, I don't talk about politics, but, you know, it might come an issue. You, you might go to church or whatever, you know, religious institution, or you might say, I don't believe in the, I only think there's male and female, you know, or I don't believe in climate change or I don't believe in, you know, that that one thing will then get you uh, into uh, trouble. And so and, and what you mentioned earlier about, yeah, yeah it was self-imposed, but also since 2020, there were plenty of examples where different countries. I was in Kazakhstan at the time and they gave us a card and they said, you cannot leave your house. You can only leave your house every other day. So one day you cannot leave your house at all. And there were p police patrols. And then the, the second day, only one person uh, can leave with the car to go to the supermarket um, uh, pharmacy or, or, or bank. So it, it wasn't self-imposed. And then when I left Kazakhstan, friends were telling me, I mean, I still have a Kazakh bank account. Uh, and, and in that bank account app, um, it's called the Ashuk app. It appears in there. I've never activated it. In Kazakhstan, to go to the coffee shop, they wouldn't let you in unless you scan the, the QR code showing your vaccinated status or PCR negative test. So you, like, you didn't even have a choice. And so, yeah, th this is this says you, this, everyone has a preferred name. You call it electronic, uh, what do you say? G gulag, digital electronic gulag. Uh, concentration camp is how I say it. Yeah, it's, it's all the same all thing. The same it's, thing. It's, it's, it's global. It's going to every country. You can't escape it because, you know, this is something we were talking about before the show. Why do you think Elon Musk is building out the the, the satellite Starlink? Uh, Facebook, you know, and Google have these internet balloons in all of these third world countries, global south. They don't want to leave a place where there is no internet. It's not about trying to get you banked. It's trying to get you on that electronic concentration camp. So they want to, so you don't have any excuse. Say, oh, in, in Japan, I was reading in, in some, like on the mountains of Japan, they're bringing internet through um, uh, I don't know, Starlink or whatever. It's like you won't have an excuse not to be connected. So it's, it's <laughs> yeah, that's where we're going. Yeah, it's wild. Just the other week, we had to replace our washing machine. And my wife was like, well, I don't want to get a smart washing machine. And I was like, well, what the hell is a smart washing machine? And she said, well, there's a new generation and that's going to eventually be able to uh, connect to the internet of things. And I know what that is. And I said, we'll just get us one that's the old style. And she said, I can't find one. I can't find one that isn't. Uh, so that, you know, this is in Poland. It's not exactly like the technology over here is as up to date as you're going to get in, say, the UK. But yeah, so we had trouble just finding a new appliance that's not potentially going to hook up to some Wi-Fi in the future to get updates and uh, send back data. How many times am I using my washing machine? That's a, yes. that's a very important point that's been on my mind because soon you won't have a choice because they're going to phase out all the old stuff and the only thing you're going to have uh, is this smart stuff. So, I mean, you can only stave it off for a while. You know, maybe you get a new old, uh, you know, washing machine. But again, how long is that going to last? You know, Maybe you'll be able to repair it. Um, but then, you know, at some point it breaks down and then your only choice is to buy this uh, smart Thing or just wash by hand i don't know or even then you know they're going to put limits on water use right so my guest um terry wolf who i talk to every week on tnt he's up in manitoba canada uh, he just said in manitoba they've got plenty of fresh water uh now the, there was an article from cbc canadian broadcast company how they're going to start limiting water now in uh, manitoba so <laughs> 
Hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, it's the writing's all on the wall, and it's you know you don't need to think too far ahead to see what's coming when it comes to your access to the basic resources. I mean, that's why up here, the first thing that I bought when we got our house, and it was a huge purchase because they're not cheap, but it was a well. It was like we need the well because you know I don't want to be relying on. I mean, we can collect rainwater too. We do that as well, but it's like the well is the biggest uh, independence you've got, and I, I could certainly maybe not here. But I can certainly see a time in other countries where they actually are going to go around and start to, you know, what you're using from that well. That water in the well is ours, you know, that groundwater. It's already been discussed in, in the US. I think it's California where it's actually rainwater is classed as the, the government. And if you take it, you're actually taking their water, even though it's falling from the rain, because they're saying the ground water where that rain would fall is ours so you've stole it from us so you know you can already see it starting to go down these lines i mean unfortunately for them over here there's a well every 100 meters if i walk in the forest there's about 10 abandoned wells so you know they'd have a difficult job getting rid of them uh anyways but yeah so that's that's where it's definitely going and it, it's getting to the point where you you would have to be somebody that's really into freedom making sure that you you try your best and do all these things go off grid uh maybe don't have all the appliances start to go back to manual things but that's an extreme way of living as well isn't it Hawaii? like it's not something the average joe and jane on the street is going to do uh, maybe we do it because we we can project the future however most people are going to be put straight into that and it's going to happen voluntarily for the most part yeah, and just to go back to the wells here in Mexico, they're already trying to do that, the, the, the government. I mean, I know people who have their own wells. Um, it's not as widespread yet. Uh, you know, it's, it's Mexico, so they don't have like a total control. There's people who have wells um, illegally or unreported. And that is the key issue. I'm thinking of buying a small piece of land outside of the city here in Mexico. And the, the number one thing is having water, having my own here what you do is you, you pay, pay a company and they dig the well for you. I mean, the water is there. You just got to dig it in. And you've got your, I mean, I know people who have little plots of land, they got fruit trees and, and, and vegetables and chickens and they're, they're set, you know, and they got the, their water. Um, they're good to go. Um, and so, yeah, that, but, but I know people who work in the, in the water industry and they're telling me like now what the government wants to do is they want to put like a meter in your well. So first of all, you're supposed to report the well to the government, like you get some kind of license and then they put something that will monitor your water usage. On your own property of, of the water and then they can come in and say oh you've used uh you know theoretically down the line and then, and then they're you know they i think they've already got drones right they go and look at people's property again it's not as widespread it's just in its uh, genesis and what your last point i'm living between two worlds like again everyone needs to decide for themselves um I think that's the most important thing. You can't just like listen to gurus and you have to, every, there's different variables. My thing is I live between, I'm trying to have the two options, urban and uh, rural. And then depending on how things go at any, any moment, switching from urban to rural, um, because it's, I mean, you, you can't go off grid. And if you're able to live like that, great, uh, fine. If you have community there, but if you, I mean, if you're going off by yourself, it's not a really good choice. Uh, there are communities forming uh, where I am here. There's uh, a, Me a Mexican community that's uh, super Catholic. They're preparing for the end of the world. Uh, there's another community being formed, uh, uh, an American uh, who's sort of trying to form a, you know, a, a, a community. I mean, he's American, so he's not Mexican. So you, you got, you have these different, uh, and this is all over Mexico and, and different parts of the world. So yeah, uh, my choice now. But my worry, though, is in the future, again, as you're saying, projecting, I can have my rural plot. But what happens if at some point I can't get from A to B from urban to rural? Because they want to get rid of cars. They want to outlaw cars. And so what am I now? I have to think strategically. Well, I can't I can't have too. I can't be too far away. The rural, you know, because. What if one day they say cars are illegal or something, or they ban them, and then I can't get, <laughs> I can't get there? It'll be like I'll, I'll spend a day or two literally walking, and so, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's yeah, it it really does feel like you know, and I, I put a, spend a lot of time thinking about these things because of, obviously we've designed our life around that. I mean, we we left the country we was living in to uh, try and try and actually survive this future and not a naive version of it the actual version i think is coming 
Uh, but it's not easy and it does feel like you're constantly running from things or not necessarily running, but having to second guess things and like, oh, no, now this is coming. Oh, Jesus, I never thought about that bit. <laughs> and it's like the net is closing in very tightly. Uh, and that is one of the key reasons, going back to what you just said, is community. It's actually being in a place where you have at least a decent amount of people who are willing to fight back. And, and one of the reasons we chose rural Poland is everyone here lives on a homestead. Everyone has chickens. Everyone has a well. Everyone hits the house on wood. 60% uh, 60, 60 of the people are, are farmers. Uh, so there's a lot of pushback when they come for those types of people. You know, I, I, you could raise a small army here of farmers that would not allow those things. So it's like, it's not necessarily trying to run away from what's coming. It's finding that community that's going to fight alongside you. Uh, if you go to where I was in the UK, for example, Hawaii, there would be no pushback. You know, it's a huge vaccination rate everyone happy with what the government's doing. So, you know, immediately for me, it was like, I have to get out of there. But it sounds to me uh, like Mexico for you is, has both worlds, you know, both worlds accessible right now. You, you know, it's a bit, I always see Mexico as a bit of a wild west. Maybe you can maybe change that view of me or say, no, that's correct, how, how it is. No, it's the wild west. That's my view too. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the spaghetti westerns, you know, Clint Eastwood, um, I'm forgetting the other guys, uh, name now the the director but um is it sergio sergio leone but anyways huge fan and it really feels still like mexico is that wild west uh government doesn't have great uh control there's crime and all of that narcos but you, you you've got both worlds because it's a big country there's a big population but you've got both the urban areas you know, i've done great interviews with greg gregory copley he, he runs the Strate International Strategic Studies uh, Association. He's like in his 70s or 80s. He's worked with diplomats, high-level guy, very smart uh, from Australia. I mean, he, he classifies, he's written books on this. The urban areas are, are gl the globalist areas, cosmopolitan. The, so any urban area in, in all of the world, that's where the globalist uh, headquarters is. Mexico City, uh, you know, New York, whatever. And then outside of that, you have more of the, traditional more more towards christian you know like sovereignty mindset kind of like what, what you were just talking about and so you want to kind of get out of the urban areas and mexico you've got that choice you, i'm in the city but you know you, you just drive for half an hour you're outside of the city there's like nothing around you've got small uh towns or croatia you know this is another point I mean, we can talk about internationalizing i've got three citizenships uh three passports i've got uh you know, family uh, place in, in 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 Croatia, and there it's again, just uh, the cities are small, the population is tiny in Croatia. There's a lot of nature. Again, you can disappear uh, into the into the wilderness, into the tiny villages where there's no one there. There's nothing. It's just pure nature. And so, yeah, we we have that option. So here in Mexico, it's, it's you know, thirty minutes. I'm one hour. I'm in the middle of nowhere. So, yeah. Yeah, we was uh, we was looking at a place not in Croatia but close to there in uh, Slovenia. Uh, that's an interesting country. It's pretty much energy independent. It's uh, very low population density, and again, just lots of mountains. You know, lots of tiny rural villages. And, and I do think that those places uh, will be the last to be drawn into the net uh, for many reasons. Uh, you could even go if you, if you really want to push your timeline out. Go to some somewhere like. Um, Albania or somewhere like that, where they're still actually using horse and cat to plow the field, you know, uh, and Mexico is a huge country. So, you know, you can kind of create any kind of vision you want out there. However, you know, I, I do think we all have to, we all have to put ourselves in the frame of mind that if we try and outrun this, it's not going to happen first and foremost, it will catch mm -hmm. up with us or our children. Mm -hmm. And secondly, that's not going to help us. You know, it's certainly, it's a, it's a coward, cowardly way to look at it. We need to actually fight back at all points. You know, it'd be, it'd be great to think you could go out to the, to Alaska or somewhere and live your life in peace and just not have to think about these things. However, that's not going to help the world. It's not going to help uh, the global community of people who actually are born with human dignity and want to retain it. Uh, anyways, let's move on, because there's a question that I wanted to ask you just to get your take on it, Hawaii, and that's um, global governance. We talk about, uh, there's, you, you said that during 2020 and 2021, there was this coming together where everyone was on the same agenda and path. How do you frame that personally? Because it's one that I have to constantly reanalyze myself and reflect on. Sovereign nations, do they exist? 
Is there a sovereign nation or is everybody actually all in this together? And how much autonomy is there across the board? Are they all at the same level? Is there different levels? It's quite a complex answer. I know you might not have the full answer because I, st I still analyze this myself, but maybe your take on it. Yeah, I've got a more, let's say, pessimistic, realistic, cynical perspective. Again, my worldview is, is full on biblical and... Um, just going back to what you said earlier, I mean, my view is that, uh, well, just a tweet from today that made me, that, that's related. Dr. Asim Malhotra, I think he's in the UK, but he's one of those guys fighting against the COVID tyranny. He just said, just received a call from a high profile figure, very supportive of my, of my work, but worried that my life is under threat. Don't get killed, he said. I have no fear of death, especially when standing up for truth and justice. It's not how long you live, but how well you live, MLK. That's sort of my view is where, I'm I'm prepared to die already. I'm 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 already prepared for death myself. And so it's like what you said. Number one is fighting and resisting. Whether you know podcast in your life and your you know, the, in here in Mexico there are local groups. Um, they're small in number, but they're organizing to form a resistance against this. The Mexican government trying to bring in digital um, currency, digital ID. And this sort of stuff. So what you just said, it's like, yes, we have to be participating in that resistance. Um, but I'm also at the same time, what we were just talking about earlier, preparing, well, what if we we lose, right? And they roll steamroll over us. Well, uh, you're just extrapolating. Well, my next best option will be going to the farm. And then at some point, you know, they'll get you there too, or or you'll just be living like in the middle ages for you know for the rest of your life. And so I'm aware of that possible scenario and so the world government thing is i mean i i believe what the book daniel says in revelation that it implies i mean there's and, and then there's an end to history at some point and christ comes back and um that it implies that there will be a world government right that this satan or antichrist will will uh, rule over all languages and, and tribes and, and and nations over rich and poor everyone uh, and then there's going to be this sort of system, Mark of the Beast system, which I think is this algorithm ghetto we're seeing now come to fruition. And I, I personally don't believe there's nation states anymore. Uh, you know, my country, Croatia, in one month's time is giving up our national currency, the Croatian kuna, and we're going to take the euro. Uh, and I, I just learned about a Croatian group that's trying to resist this now. And they're trying to get people, they're posting flyers all over Croatia, and, and, and they're saying the same thing I was saying, um, that this is, your national sovereignty is gone. If you don't have your own currency, you don't have a nation. So, and now we're hearing talk of my other president of Mexico, AMLO, one month ago, it's on his official website transcript, where he and Secretary of State Blinken were discussing, literally they say, a North American union, and they say integrating Canada, USA, and Mexico. I've been talking about this for 20 years. I interview. I had the last living interview with the father of the North American Union, Dr. Robert Pastor, member of the Council of Foreign Relations. He passed in 2014 from cancer. I interviewed him December 2013 with my students here in Mexico. I've met him in person and because uh, he would visit our campus. So basically, they're forming the North American Union. So I, I've always been saying the EU is, is fascist. It's totalitarian. It's a technocracy. It's the blueprint for world government. Because you're taking nation states and creating this supranational structure. you got 28 countries now uh, plugged into this EU to, uh, you know, globalist structure. And then that's the model for the rest of the world's regions. And, and AMLO said, we want to create a North American Union based on the EU model. Exactly. A few days ago, Rafael Correa, former president of Ecuador, he comes out and said, you know, it's so cool. Lula won uh, in Brazil. It's the first time in history we have four leftist presidents, you know, Mexico, um, Colombia, Petro, uh, Brazil, Lula, and this Croatian, uh, Chilean, Boric, uh, you know, in Chile. And Correa says uh, that, he, that they want to create the South American Union. And Lula, in, in May, he said he wants to create the Sur, a common currency for South America, Sur. So you have a Euro, uh, a Mero, uh, Sur, and... Uh, Southeast Asian Union it was reported just a few weeks ago. They're trying to pool their currencies together to create a new digital currency that will be a common currency for Southeast Asia. So I personally don't believe nation states exist anymore when I see people you know, with a Mexican flag, because I'm a proud Mexican, or Croatian flag, I'm proud of Croatian. Um, 
I, I, I don't really care anymore about raising flags because these people don't get it. We don't have nation states anymore. Uh, you know, everyone knows Klaus Schwab has bragged about penetrating the cabinets, you know, World Economic Forum. 50% of Canadian governments penetrated. I can see it here in Mexico. My governor is a full-on globalist. Uh, he's, you know, he's, he's proposed internal Soviet passport system. Like I live in the state of Jalisco, one of the 31 Mexican states. He proposed to exit Jalisco, the state, and to enter, you'd have to have be vaccinated with the passport. So was it, if I go to the beach uh, outside of the state here in Mexico and I want to come back, like what? They won't let me in? To my own, where my own houses in the state, like this is, and then another governor in Mexico, Samuel Garcia, Nuevo León, he proposed a law. I mean, he's he's pushing climate change, limiting water use. Uh, he tried to pass a law where if you criticize him online, if you make fun of him, you get thirty six hours jail and and fine. So, uh, it's, I mean, we're talking about Mexico. It's penetrated. Mexican government is penetrated. The Croatian government is penetrated. The Kazakh government, where I used to live, is penetrated. You see it everywhere. All of our governments are penetrated. And they're they're locked into this global system of the private infrastructure and the public uh, uh, globalist infrastructure. So, I and, and then that's that's the global government. So you know we're gonna have the WHO pronounce tomorrow whatever they want. Uh, you know new new lockdown. All everyone will in lockstep. You know apply, apply, all governments will apply this system. So I I think I think we are we're already in world government. We're here. It's not as obvious. It's not like someone comes and says, oh, you know, world government. It's we're already it's like a spider weaving its web, like uh, Frodo in uh, Lord of the Rings, where he wakes up and the spiders, you know, weaving. He's already in in there. That, that's where we're at, and so we, we're just a few steps away towards the total global uh, control, in my opinion. It's, it's funny you mentioned Frodo. I think at the minute we all feel like Frodo, or at least Sam, <laughs> you know, running around trying to overcome the great odds. Um, yeah, and you know, the same thing in Africa too. They're coming together with a union, talking about a, a joint currency. It's happening everywhere. Uh, and you know, like I'm not, I'm not a complete black pill pessimist in that I think that every world leader is on board, but I think every world leader is is on board, if that makes sense. Like they might not want to do it, they might want to keep the sovereignty, like Poland, for example, it's a very, you know, time and time again, they've voted against the EU um, expansion and they've tried to retain as much sovereignty. In fact, it's National Day tomorrow, Independence Day, there's the flags everywhere. Uh, however, you know, you're going up against something that is so powerful, it encompasses all of the biggest banks, all the biggest CEOs, global finance, global industry. I mean, how do you go against that as a small nation? They would crush you. Uh, so what you've got to try and do is get a, better deal for your country but that deal still is probably totalitarian and awful in the long run uh so i, I do think there are probably some people out there that are, you know they don't like it i mean I, I can't imagine they go to bed thinking oh this is great for us all uh however that they're, they're going to be dragged along anyways whether they like it or not and if not somebody else will come along or, the, or, or they'll have a boating accident <laughs> you know, yeah i mean I, I i just saw a clip um i i use telegram a lot shout out you know join my Geopolitics and Empire Telegram, I think I got over 11,000 subscribers. And one channel that I subscribe to is Medicos for, uh, you know, Doctors for uh, the Truth in, in Mexico. They share a lot of good content. They posted a video of Bolsonaro, uh, a Freemasonic ceremony with Bolsonaro participating. I don't know if Bolsonaro of Brazil was getting uh, coronated, but even Bolsonaro, who seems at times seems to be anti-globalist, He's a Freemason. And again, people might have different views. I, I view Freemasonry as, you know, it's Luciferian. And um, what's he doing there? So that, that, that tells you something. I, I had a classmate back in Geneva from Africa. I believe it was Gabon, but I'm not sure. Uh, I talked a lot about Freemasonry in Geneva. A lot of my, all, you know, I, I went to school of diplomacy. Like all the people around me, you, you were Freemason. And... I was a thorn in people's side because I'm anti-Freemason and I was bringing this stuff up and my classmate tells me, oh yeah, my uncle ran for political, I don't know if he he he, won, he, he ran or he, he won successful, successfully, I think he did, but to be to run for political office in, in Gabon, you had to become, a, you had to be a Freemason, otherwise you couldn't run. And so um, uh, th there's that. And then I, I think what, what you just mentioned, it's useful to apply game theory. I like game theory as well, you know, using all of these different uh uh, resources and it's just what you said. I think it's also game theory. You might have people like Orban, 
I don't know, Bolsonaro or whatever. And the elites, it's like game theory. You know, you, you've only got certain moves that anyone can make. They close off these options and then they heard you here each, each, you know, each time you, you have less and less options. It's, it's, it's game theory. And so they can just sort of gamify, uh, apply game theory to these uh, holdouts. And there's only so much you can do, just as you said, like, um, you know, AMLO here in Mexico, he was not pro lockdown, uh, but there were others around him that were more captured. And it was this struggle in Mexico between pushing vaccines and forcing masks and, and, you know, so it's a perfect example of what you're talking about, but eventually they're going to overrun in numbers. It's like a war of attrition. Um, and I'm feeling it too. After years now, I'm getting tired. We're all getting tired, uh, demoralized. They have more resources. Uh, and so they can play the long game. Uh, and, and, you know, AMLO will be gone eventually and we'll get an, an, another one of their yes, men. And the end goal is to get rid of human politicians the technocracy means uh, and you're seeing it in different places i interviewed joe allen recently who's on steve bannon's war room he called john fetterman the first cyborg candidate and uh it's it's like yeah we're there they want to get slowly more slowly i think you will see this trend where you'll have less politicians and then you'll have more decisions made by ai or software that's where we're going and so like I, in croatia they have this e-citizenship system. Um, I have access to it, but you can log in with a smart card. You know, I have a USB smart card reader in my computer, and you, know, you can just log in to your uh, account as a Croatian, as an e-citizen. You can download your, um, you know, your whatever, your marriage certificates or whatever, your uh, documents. And I think that's going to be, you, you won't have to go down to your local office. I mean, th eventually they'll probably get rid of them. You won't have people at your lo local, you know, um, whatever government office you'll do everything uh online so yeah i think that's where we're headed <laughs> yeah yeah that's that, that's definitely the world it'll be uh, uh you know if you won't if you want to go do some government admin you'll set up your computer and it'll either be a virtual representation of a person uh, and you may put on a silly headset or maybe it'll be just like this i imagine it'll be the former because eventually you know uh and yeah your whole life will be lived through the data miners, you know, whatever they want to mine off you, you'll have there'll be some access point to that. And of course, the ultimate is to actually have people themselves be a part of that. And that is the ultimate goal. Uh, and they're making great strides in that as well, as we've seen. So yeah, it's it's an ex, you know, and it's a huge thing to come up against, you know, for for us all. Like, and like you said, I I, I really think um, I mean, maybe we could go back to that. You mentioned revelations and uh, a lot of people that I speak to through my channel say, you know, it's a spiritual war. And I say exactly the same back. It's a spiritual war. However, I also do think that it's a very dangerous thing for us to uh, frame that as an absolute like it is revelations, probably because uh, our collective subconscious in the West has revelations in it. And whether you're religious or not, we all have it deeply embedded in this. And it's an extremely powerful narrative and story. And if you look at people like the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab particularly, they are very, very, uh, very, very good at creating narratives and project them and projecting them on us so that we actually enact them for them. And I do believe that they are purposely, they're purposely trying to symbolize revelations, to push it on us. Because if we believe that, or if we allow ourselves to, to think that, then there's a potential that we actually cannot muster up the will to overcome it because it almost feels like destiny you know revelations is what's more powerful than biblical prophecy you know it could actually trap us in this mindset where we think you know we it, it's 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 destiny it's destined to happen so i always just say like and i would like to get your opinion on that should we be cautious about that is this something is there something artificial about this um and them actually using this um our western subconscious uh, our western mythology and belief to try and force us into actually enacting it for them or just at, at least becoming submissive to it. Well, that's a great point. My, my view is that, you know, the book of Revelation is, is it separate that yes, there's a danger, like what you just mentioned of them creating these narratives and projecting them to be themselves to be more powerful than they really are. I think that's definitely true. What, what you just mentioned. So we have to be careful right there, but you know, again, I said, you know, everyone has their own different beliefs. My belief, I, I, I would be a fundamentalist Christian, basically. I believe in the Bible, and um, 
I, I believe that the prophecy is it's it's foretold. Like I, I don't believe people are following it as a script. The way I view it is that God knows what's going to happen. He just told us, look, this is what's going to happen. You know, this is what they're going to do. Like he he told us, like he see, he saw what they're going, their plans are. And it's I think it's sort of like game theory applied universally. God knows he's the creator of the game and he knows all the things that can be carried out. And then he knows, you know, what the, the, what Satan is going to do and how he's going to do it because there's no other way to do it, you know, world government. And so I think, I think my view of revelation is like, it's going to happen at some point. I don't know when it could be, you know, 2030s. It could be a century from now. I don't know. I'm not, I, I, and I don't like putting, it's very bad to put these like dates on. So I think it's, it's, a, it's going to happen. Um, but uh, that's, I don't think these people are following it as a script. Um, and I had other thoughts that are leaving me now. Uh, uh, but you know, nonetheless, it's not, as I was going back to earlier, like, ah, I I've interviewed people like Patrick Wood, the technocracy expert, right? Patrick Wood, he's a Christian, um, and I interviewed the Canadian pastor, uh, um, Arthur Palowski, Polish, right? Uh, Arthur Palowski. You know, after the interview, Palowski told me uh, about this, and I think during the interview with Patrick Wood, he said they both agreed. We all agree, you know, Patrick, um, Arthur, and myself, that it, it, Satan throughout history is every time attempting to achieve this global system, like I view the 1930s, Nazi Germany, Mussolini, all that stuff. That was an attempt by Satan to, you know, through Nazi Germany or I don't know what, create his world government. You know, the Nazis had plans to take over the United States if they succeeded with Europe. Uh, you know, that would have been that was his big attempt to go for the gold. It failed. Right. Here we are, you know, 80 whatever years later. Uh, and Patrick Wood and, and Arthur Pulaski agreed that. We're in that moment again. We're trying again. He could succeed or he could fail, depending on us or whether God says it's not time yet or he says, all right, it's going to happen. And so th that's that sort of hope where it's going to happen. But at the same time, we, you know, our duty is, 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 is to fight, you know, fight for truth and justice and all that is good and resist um, evil. And that's simple. Like if, if they're trying to come in and, and force inject you, that's evil with a poison. I must resist that. Or if they're trying to put you on this electronic totalitarian concentration camp, that's evil. Resist it. Regardless if it's if it's going to win or not, you, you it's that principle of resisting evil. Like 300, the movie uh, 300, right? Where they, they, they lose, but they fight to the death. That's my, that's the way I view it. That even if I'm going to die, I'm going to give it my all against evil. Um, but I think at some point this, you know, revelation will come. I don't know when. But, uh, you know, maybe all of this will fall apart and then, we'll, you know, we'll have another 50, 80 years of um, liberty and freedom. Maybe not. Uh, but, you know, I've, you know, even the Pastor Palowski said, you know, if, if this continues, you know, we could be close. So <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, and it could it could even be as well. Like my, my wife put it quite well. She said um, actually trying to trigger it. And that was an interesting way of looking at it, too. You know, there's three ways of looking at it. There are the. Try, trying to project it on us with their symbolism you know you see like the, the they like to add the, the the numeral 666 all over the place for fun and there's patents that come out by the microsoft that are 66 you know what i mean you start to see it and it sometimes feels very contrived or uh or, or the other way it could actually be revelations or the other one could be they're actually trying to trigger revelations because in my mind and i think in the same in your mind too, although you can comment on this and let me know, um, I actually believe that they're deeply religious. I think they're satanic and sat satanism is not the um, rejection of religion. It's actually deeply religious. And um, th in their mind, they are they are trying to harm God. They're trying to rebel against uh, morality and the moral code that Jesus brought to us. And that is why the things they do harm the innocent the most. And, that, that you know, we, we could talk about that for hours, but that's how I frame it personally so um i think they're deeply religious and it could be well be that they're trying to trigger that um the triggered the antichrist returning no i i think the six again i i view revelation as the post-mortem it's like this is what's going to happen they're not using it as a guide what they're doing is uh, what you know what, what they're doing that's their deeply held philosophy and spiritual belief the 666 is all over the place it's what they really believe 
they're not doing it because of revelation or to freak us out. It's their core belief. I mean, last night I was watching a documentary. I love the the ministry, Good Fight uh, Ministries, uh, Pastor Joe Schimmel in California. It's about Marvel. He did one on rock and roll. Now he's looking at the comic world. It's mind blowing. He gives you the primary source footage of the comic artists themselves. Batman, Iron, Iron Man is the Antichrist. I'm not joking. Like it's in the own words. He he shows these interview clips. Uh, the I'll comics. Check this out. What was it called again? Uh, right. Um, well, the min- I forget the name, uh, but it's called the Ministries. Good fights, Ministries. You'll Good find their fights. YouTube channel. But basically, he's showing that the, all these artists are literally a cult. They're practitioners of Aleister Crowley. Batman is uh, Lucifer, literally. Uh, Batman and, and Iron Man is like Antichrist. And all of these uh, Marvel comics, they're all basically what we've been talking about. It's all occult and satanic. And it's in the own words of the artists themselves. There's no stereo conspiracy. Um, and that's the kind of research I love which is which, which is why it's so mind-blowing and so yeah I, you know jay dyer and others look into the more occult esoteric stuff and yeah this is what they believe they believe in the 666s it's got you know that's their man's you know satan's thing uh, you know alistair crowley occult esoteric uh, i i attended when i was in geneva 2009 uh you know lucifer publishing company founded in 1922 by alice bailey you know basically satan is the cultist um, she's, she was influenced by 19th century theosophist, Satanist Helena Blavatsky. Lucifer Publishing Company changed its name to Lutz's Trust. They have three offices, New York, London, and Geneva. Their Lutz's Trust, you can go to their website, lutzestrust.org, I think. I subscribe to their newsletter. They literally believe that Lucifer is the Christ. The Lucifer is the Messiah. He's Prometheus. He is the Maitreya. He is the Mahdi because the Muslims believe there will come also in their eschatology that the, there will come sort of uh, um, this Mahdi figure, kind of like their Jesus. And the Lucifer Trust says, oh, um, you know, Lucifer is, is, is the Christ. He's the Mahdi for all of the religions. And they're actively preparing for the return of Lucifer, Lucifer Trust. Lucifer Trust is an NGO that's officially a member of the United Nations and of the ECOSOC Council. And um, I think they manage the the meditation room at the UN headquarters in New York. I've attended one of their meetings uh, because their office is right across the plaza from the UN in Geneva. Um, and I even have one of their pamphlets here with me from, from 2009, from 13 years ago. And, and in the pamphlet, you know, it talks about Prometheus and Lucifer bringing light to humanity, fire, you know. From heaven, and so this is literally what they believe. And you know, you and I, at the UN, like the the, the, the UN Geneva, I, I would go there all the time for lunch and whatever work. And the coffee room is—it's literally—it's on their map. I, uh, you know, years ago I found the out. You can find the official layout of the UN Geneva, and it says Serpentine Lounge. So the coffee room is called the Serpentine Lounge. You've got the Lucifer Trust right across the street. They believe you know Lucifer's coming back. Uh, you know, I can give you many examples of, of, of these sorts of things. So it's it's real. They believe in it. It's not conspiracy theory. I've got the pamphlets. I attended the meetings myself. I've had coffee in the Serpentine Lounge. Uh, you know, you, you, we can go on and on about that stuff. It's real. But, you know, people who, you know, maybe are more inclined towards atheism want to sort of brush that off. And it's like, well, look, guys, these people really believe in the devil. Uh, so, you know, that kind of makes me think, well, the devil's real. God is real. So, you know. Put that in, uh, try to square that circle. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. And you, yeah, we could talk about that a long time there. Uh, you know, the worship of Saturn and the return of uh, Lucifer and all those things. Um, and yeah, the, I, I, th- I think it's easy just to say that they absolutely have a very complex belief system and um, that guides them. And, um, and you know, it, it, even if you just look at it from a very simple psychological perspective, in that you were very rich. You've got awful, like tremendous amounts of money. You know, let's imagine you're one of the old monarchies or something. You've got a tremendous amount of money. You've got infinite opportunities to enjoy every single human pleasure. Uh, but there's some things that you can't do because they're illegal or because there's a, there's Judeo-Christian ethics and values ascribed to a society. Um, so what do you do? Do you become a really, <laughs> you know, having tried every pleasure a thousand times, do you become really morally 
and virtuous and uh, and disciplined. No, these people are idiots. You know, they've, they've, they've got they've got none of that. They're very dumb people. And then and then all of a sudden they get offered something else. That's something that can bring more excitement. Machiavellian. They can start to control people, uh, play God, and, and you know it's very alluring. I imagine somebody that's got born with infinite infinite amount of power in general. Uh, and of course, there's also the idea of um, becoming God yourself, which is this transhuman idea where they can become God. And um, just moving on from that, because I'm conscious we, we've only got a certain amount of time. Um, how do you feel, uh, Herboy, about this whole East and West? Because we see a difference in approach in the East, like we see out and out authoritarianism. And, um, and I guess the way it's framed is that the US empire is coming down and the Eastern empire is rising and there's antagonism there. And it's like a battle between uh, two sides of the planet, uh, the US empire and their imperialism, and now the East rising. Uh, do you frame it like that? Or do you see them as just two sides of the same coin enacting the same thing in different way? In the West, we do it with a faux democracy, democratic totalitarianism, let's say. And in the East, it's more of an authority. Do you see it like that? Or do you think that there is a genuine um, a genuine antagonism and split between the two. I think there are a lot of um, contradictions uh, in that sense, but ultimately, I think there's not much difference between East and West. It's a moot point. I'm more of on the camp of like Ian Davis and James Corbett and and others, uh, both who I've interviewed, because uh, we're already in world government. So you're basically choosing. You have ice cream. And you're choosing between chocolate or vanilla um, ice cream. And there are contradictions because I think, you know, the Chinese, Russians, and, and what, they're all globalists. I mean, look, I was, I technically worked for Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, the first president of Kazakhstan from 1990 until I think like 2018, almost 30 years he was president. I, I, he created in 2009 the Nazarbayev University in uh, Astana and uh, 20 inter Nazarbayev intellectual schools. I worked in one of those schools and supposedly in 1994, it was Nazarbayev's idea and Putin is running with it, a Eurasian union. And I, I've been to Nazarbayev's private or library foundation in Astana um, and you can see his museum and he's got books which literally laud globalism. So you've got Putin and Nazarbayev promoting this globalist project of Eurasian Union. You get, you get what I'm saying? And then you see them implementing the same technocratic controls in Russia, the QR code digital passport in China, like crazy, uh, in all of these countries. So what does that tell you? I mean, that you forget the words. I, I think the contradictions come in where you've got these global elites sitting around the, the global pie, the, the global government pie and, and table. And of course, I think the Western elites... They want to be the ones in charge. I mean, it's it's like you go back to these movies where you've got uh, no, no no honor among thieves, you know, or all these demon films. You know, the, the documentary I was watching last night, like in Marvel, you know, all, all these Marvel characters are basically demons, like in, in the writer's own words. I mean, if you look at it, they're basically all like fallen angels and demons, and they're fighting over with each other over um, status and power. And so I sort of view this where, of course, the Russians and Chinese, rightfully so, I think, wouldn't want to be subordinates in this global system. And again, that ma makes sense. I, I, I wouldn't want to be subordinate. I don't think it's fair that you know the Russians and Chinese would, or global South would be subject, you know, in level, tier two to this Western Davano, Davos system. So I think that's fair. That's where you see that contradiction, where the geopolitical battle that we're seeing fought. Uh, in that sense, there's that contradiction, but. At the end of the day, they're all implementing the same uh, stuff. And this multipolar world, if you think about it, that's actually the road to world government, in my view. There's people who say the world multipolar world is going to bring us a utopia. I actually think the reverse. If you actually study academically global governance, world government, world federation, you need to have a multipolar world to have world government. And I think I'm coming to this late. I don't want to believe this, but I think it's true. You know, the United States model, it brought us freedom for a while, but I think it's actually the model for world government. It's almost like a Trojan horse because this federal system from, you know, in the late 1700s, that's that system create that creates a, a world federal system that gets you world government. And 
Yeah, I, unfortunately, I mean, it's a really black pill to swallow, but I think multipolar world will, because you, you can't have a unipolar world government. You have to have all of the world's nations more or less on the level to then be plugged into this, you know, world government, feder- world federation. And there's many associations. You got they want to create the UN parliamentary uh, assembly. You've got the World Federalist Movement, and their goal is to have a multipolar system where all 200 nations are plugged in to this super world government system, like the regional union system. You know, the EU. You got 28 countries that plug into the EU. They want all 200 countries to plug into the World Federation, and you have your world government. That's so. It's for me. It's a Trojan horse. So. I mean, look at China, look, you know, in Russia, they're doing the QR codes in Kazakhstan and and Vietnam, every country. So I don't really see that uh, helping us much. Yeah, that's like, that's pretty much how I frame it as well. That there, you know, there's a, it, it's no different than when the monarchies of Europe uh, sat down and went to war with each other. Cousins, uh, aunts, uncles, all, all hung out separately. But when it was wartime, it's like playing a game of chess. They want they all wanted a bigger piece of the wealth pie. Uh, and if one got vanquished, they'd all sit down and have a cigar afterwards, pat each other on the back and say, you know, you did you did a good job there, but we come out on top. You know, I think it's similar to that. You know, it's a big club. Um, however, yeah, people don't want to be subordinate. People want more influence. You've got a lot of people in the West who have had, you know, a thousand, hundred, well, let's say a few at least 500 years of wealth accumulated in the West in terms of the elite families over here, uh, the banking families, the industrialists. And, you know, they don't want to see the West become subordinate to the East because, you know, why would they? And the oligarchs in the East and the elites over there, don't, they don't want to be subordinate to the West. So, yeah, it's it's like that. And geopolitics is is the playground to, to, for them to sort out those things. However, um, if you look back throughout history, um, you know, you look back at after Germany was vanquished in World War II, uh, most of the top Nazis were, were in, a lot, many of them were employed. Some of them were employed immediately to continue to actually see over Germany's re, uh, reconstruction. Uh, and this happens throughout the world. It's the same with uh, a totalitarian Europe after the Soviet Empire fell. Lots of the ex Soviet officials were used by the US to ensure that they enacted the US's. Uh, policies and agendas and they got very well paid roles so you know the way we frame it is that we're in this fight of good versus evil because that's the narrative however it's not like that uh, it's actually much much more similar to what you said um is there anywhere you see that is opposing this and i'm talking about outside of the sovereign level is there any is there any collective power that is opposing this or is it just us as individuals coming together as communities yeah, I, I don't see any other <laughs> power. It's just basically us. Um, you know, I think it's important, like you said, I'm um, as a Christian, I'm a member of a local church. Uh, you know, I think churches form uh, a resistance, uh, as well as what we were talking about earlier, a local community that sort of sort of gets what, what's going on if they're not religious, but they understand all the everything we're talking about this global government system, and they're preparing. Uh, you know, on a financial, economic, uh, physical level to weather that storm. And so I think it's, I had a, you know, I, I had a Ralph Scholhammer, uh great uh, guest I had on recently, Austrian academic. He, he was talking about what you were saying about the elites having everything that they want and they don't know what to do uh, anymore. So they want to rule over us. And then South African security expert uh, Gideon Hubert was uh, talking about how we need to form networks of bubbles like in our local community you've got uh, civil gr- groups that are coming together to deal with you know security and crime other groups dealing with you know maybe food security and then you have to build these sort of bubbles of networks um uh around you and so yeah i don't i don't really see anyone else we have this e- evil this global entity um at the global level doing this and then it's just us and i, I again for me it, I believe in in Jesus and God, but uh, we're in this film, in this video game. It's playing out, uh, and so I, I always go back to Teddy Roosevelt. You know, in 2020, I interviewed Ricardo Bossi, former Australian Special Forces. He's head of Australia One Party. It really stuck with me what he said. I mean, you really you can't do much more. It's do what you can with what you got uh, where you're at. And, you know, a lot of the stuff I'm doing is just in- intuitive. It's it's logical. All of the stuff that I do to try to prepare for this stuff is just some common sense what you would do depending on, you know, with how much money you have, where you are. Th- th- that's all you can do. And so uh, I don't know what else I can tell you. <laughs>
No, no, I, I think that's put it well. And uh, yeah, and I think actually it's probably for the better that there is, uh, I think it's for the better that people start to tune out of the vision of having um, that Russia is the savior or that's, mm -hmm. you know, this politician that, that you really like, you know, this new guy in Canada, people are getting behind uh, Pierre. Uh, no, don't do that because that's going to make you inactive. You, you, we are the solution, and what you know, we're the ones that are going to shift this towards a, a better outcome or, or allow ourselves to be steamrolled. And I think you have to always. And if somebody comes along and helps, great. However, don't don't put your faith in other people because it's not going to help us. Uh, you need to really take action in your own life. I, I, I think if people take um, real serious self responsibility. Uh, that's the solution. You know, it's for people to to take to take real serious self responsibility, try and self actualize. You know, live with, live by principles, whether it's religious or philosophical, whatever it is. That is what will shift humanity towards a better place. And um, maybe it's a bit more of an Eastern belief because I, I studied theology, but I studied a lot of Eastern religions. But I do follow the teachings of the Bible. However, I also believe we have a collective energy or consciousness and you know their goal is to try and make that very fearful very submissive and our goal is to try and make it hopeful and strong uh, and that could quite quickly trigger change if you got a you know significant amount of people that were showing courageous elements that were standing up uh, because let's face it 90 percent 80 percent of society will go along with whatever feels safest and what the crowd's doing it's basic human psychology uh, and the government you know they've got control of the media and all of the and all of the information. However, they don't live in our communities. <laughs> and, you know, if your local community has a strong presence of people like you, everyone else is going to say, well, you know, I know the government's saying that, but these guys live here and, you know, we'll go along with the crowd. And, you know, you can soon soon trigger change that way. Uh, but it has to start at an individual level from the ground up. It's not going to come from the top down. Uh, and that's why I think it's actually good to frame it that way, that nobody's coming to save us here. Uh, we you, you save yourself and then you start saving other people if you can, if you can extend your hand out and that's the way it'll work. Is there any um, advice that you would give before we go, Hravoy, to people that, um, that are maybe just all of a sudden waking up to the, what's going on and thinking, oh my God, what <laughs> like this is not the life that I pictured for myself and it's not the world as I thought it would run. How, how, how would you advise that person to start taking, taking action, actionable steps? Uh, number one, find Jesus. Number two, uh, well, uh, number two, um, don't freak out. You know, it's keep a level head, remain calm, keep calm, right? And carry on um, and just start. Uh, it, it, it's like when you're in a dangerous situation the worst thing you can do is freak out that that leads you to your death quickly i've been in a i've been assaulted with a, a gun uh, with a knife and uh, the you know the first time with a gun it was like i was freaked out you know a gun in my face in chicago uh and that that was a moment where i was just like beside myself that was the first time i ever experienced anything like that but i was thankful because I learned my lesson. And then the second time it happened in Mongolia, when a guy had a broken vodka bottle uh, trying to mug me, um, I had gone through that experience and I was calm now. I could have freaked out, but I was in that split second calculating my options, my game theory. And I found the path of least resistance, which was just to comply, give him money. And he, and then I was able to just quickly before he decided to make any further action, just walk away. So you have to remain calm. And I would say first get educated, you know, create a scheme, uh, a lay of the land, understand your threats, that, you know, in, in your local area. What, what are your threats? Calculate your options financially. Um, start finding like-minded people. Uh, you know, we can, it's, it's great connecting virtually, but you also have to find like-minded people where you are. Uh, and then, you know, create a plan of, of what, what you can do to... Unplug, decentralize, you know, shout out to one of my sponsors, my new sponsor, Above Phone, uh, Ramiro Romani. He's, uh, I, I've looked at this, you know, in terms of smartphones, um, I've bought the black phone 10 years ago. It was a dud. Uh, and the best option in terms of phone is de-Googling your phone. That's your only option. There's no like phone you can buy that's safe. So doing things like 
like that decentralizing unplugging, de-googling, shutting down your PayPal account, uh, alternative ways to store your money, local bank, crypto, uh, gold, silver, um, trying to stop shopping at the big box stores and shopping at local, uh, you know, uh, farmers or, or little shops that are, you know, this general, so make a plan of action, uh, and then carry it out and you just try to unplug it as much as you can from all of these, uh, systems, try to go analog as much as possible and, and to become more sufficient, like start trying to plant food. Um, yeah. And, and, and you start segueing towards that. Just don't freak out, you know, <laughs> remain calm, level-headed, sober, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to tell you. No, I think that's great. And uh, yeah, the only thing I'd add as well is just um, be willing to uh, sacrifice, you know, comfort and and what you, you know, a lot of these things require you to just make small sacrifices. But, you know, by default, humans will, all animals will tend towards what's easiest, you know, because it makes life easier. You know, it, it's not as easy for me to get water than as somebody who turns on the tap because my well's not connected to a house. I've got to go out, even in winter, if it's freezing pipes, I've got to boil a hot pan on the stove, take it out, pour it on there, I've got to carry the buckets in, you know, it's, it's, it's a chore, you know. So, but you've got to accept that if you want to do these things that you just suggested, some of them will require an extra step or two. However, the things that you gain from it may not be visceral or immediate that you can see, but they're huge, you know, to not be giving all that data away to, to, to not have a profile of you expanding because we don't see that. We have to remember it when we're doing these things. You have to remember your phone's actually doing that. Your phone knows everywhere you've gone for the past like five years, like everywhere. It knows who you speak to whenever you come into contact with someone else, but you've got to remind yourself of that. Uh, and then all of a sudden it doesn't feel like a chore to carry a bucket of water or to, use a use a dumb phone rather than a smartphone you know what i mean so yeah i think i think great advice there and where can people find you Haroy? um how can they help you support you uh let us know uh, obviously i'll put it all in the comment uh description mm -hmm. anyways but maybe you could point people in the right direction yeah just uh in the address bar go direct geopolitics and empire.com if you type in, I still can't believe people, uh, when I tell them, I meet people here, Mexicans, and I'm like, oh, this is my podcast, my, what, what, it comes up, and they do, they'll pull out their phone and just go in Google, they will, in the Google search, put geopolitics and empire. I'm blacklisted. My website doesn't appear in the Google search. So then they don't find it. I'm like, people have no clue about what, <laughs> I can't believe people still don't get it. But anyways, it's a geopo you can use the alter alternative search engines, geopolitics and empire.com. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I live on uh, donations. If people like what I do, they can send money. Um, I do consultations. So if one, someone wants to chat more about expatriating uh, or whatever, they can uh, pay a fee to chat with me for a half hour, an hour or whatever uh, about anything. And, uh, you know, what I, I have a membership, like five bucks a month. So I've re been really behind on, on fulfilling my obligations for my members. But it, in, in any case, it seems most of them, are doing it just sort of to support me. I do like a monthly call with members. We just shoot the breeze for one, two hours uh, talking about stuff. Um, and I try to do a weekly audio, just giving my thoughts. And so there's that and TNT Radio, tntradio.live. Um, actually, I, I was interviewed by Rick Moon in March. Uh, so I was a guest on Rick Moon's show. And then soon after, they offered me a, a gig, which was so cool. And um they they must have seen what I do with my podcast, and then uh, it's been fun doing TNT Radio, a whole new sort of thing. And so yeah, TNT Radio Live and uh, GeopoliticsNumber dot com. Nice, nice, awesome. So uh, yeah, so go check out uh, Hawaii's fantastic interviews. You've had some, you have such a diverse range of people, but also the depth that you have there is just huge. Today I was saying just as we started. I was on a run this morning. I was halfway through one episode. I finished that. I stuck on another episode. So you're keeping me in shape right now, right? Because <laughs> I ended up running for about two hours today, which uh, is a lot longer than I planned. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just going back to the water. I mean, I don't mind uh, if I have to go to my well. And uh, there's something cathartic, uh, therapeutic about that lifestyle. I mean, I, I live like that in Mongolia. Um and it's, it's exercise. So you're getting your exercise done uh, as well. And you're staying healthy if you have to carry your water. And um, yeah, I, I also discovered, as I said, I enjoy your site. And soon I want to have you on Geopolitics and Empire. Uh, your story is crazy how you escaped the UK uh, and you're out in 
Poland and I want to focus more. I always ask my guests like to get to, to get their diagnosis of what's going on in the world. But I think the hour is late. Uh, I think it's it's a, uh, everyone knows, uh, you know, the, the people who are who know and who are going to know who get it, get it. The others, they're lost. And now it's like time to focus on the road ahead. Uh, and so I think I'll have you on just to focus on um, how do you leave a place like the UK and go to somewhere like Poland? And then how do you set up shop off grid? And so that's what we need to be thinking about now. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. I, I would love that. Um, uh, I'd, it'd be an honor to be on your show because like I said, your your caliber of guests is fantastic. So you know, if I could add just a single drop of knowledge to that great reservoir you've created, that would be me, me very happy. Uh, and and yeah, I, I agree too. The hour is very late. And uh, sadly, because of their ability to enact these global crises and to lock everyone down, I really feel if you haven't made those decisions now, it could be taken out of your hands at any moment. And there may not be another chance. You know, there may not be another chance. Where you sit may be the place where you have to face this. So just always acknowledge that. Doesn't mean don't do stuff, but, you know, just be aware that anything could change at any moment. You know, nobody expected 2020 and 2021, not the way it happened. So anyways, thank you so much for joining us. Hawaii. Like I said, I'm a huge fan of your show and I look forward to us uh, speaking again. Me too. Hasta la vista.